So one of the you know, we hear a lot about um, sort of changes that are required to improve whatever we want in academia, whether it's sort of better systems for citation and measuring impact. It strikes me that as a funder, you you, know, you have an opportunity, um, call it a carrot or a stick. You know, mm. People need to get funding, um, yeah. um, and um, there are you know incentives that uh, you know you have a ways of incentivizing that as as the grant check holders. Mm. How, how do those conversations go? at the MRC or between funders about your role in kind of encouraging or mandating change. I'd love some insight into <laughs> what you kind of feel your role is in that uh, and, and, and how those conversations go. Because some funders behave differently, right. well, some trusted famously, withheld grant checks because of yeah. you know, not following policies of, of the academic yeah. chair. Can you give us a bit of insight into yeah. kind of how those go? Okay, so um, I think uh, it's always changing um, I think uh, we have much better uh, harm harmony between the research councils, for a start, than we have ever had. Um, and part of that is that you know we're increasingly squeezed administratively, and so we we we, we have to make sure that that works really well, um, and and it does. So we're much more speaking of uh, with one voice. But of course, there are many funders in the in the UK, um, and um, you, w the MRC, when we set about collecting output data, we gave it a year um, without um, in you know without coming with the stick, um, and we got 80% there. So we, when we first went out to collect outputs. Um, we explained, we, we had the advantage of we were coming up to the 2010 spending review, but we explained to the research community why we needed this data. And as I say, we got over 80% of, of the sort of response rate. But we needed the sanctions and to get the stick out for the other sort of 15% or so. Um, so we do withhold funding uh, because we, we, I think if we're serious about this, we need to be very clear. Um, and the other research councils will be in the same position, having given it a year, they expect to inclu include sanctions um, in the next data gathering period uh, next year. Um, and yeah, I, we, we've got, there are plenty of forums where we work across funders. Uh, in health research, we have the UK Clinical Research Collaboration, um, 20 or 30 organisations getting together and coordinating health research in the UK. Um, things like Oscar as well um, play a role in, in trying to get these things agreed. I, I think what we do need to do is improve that um, exchange and discussion with universities. And I was really pleased to come up here to Edinburgh because I talked to colleagues in Edinburgh and Anne, uh, Anna Clements uh, this morning about doing just that. Universities are more in touch with how the different aspects of that task force makes them impactful. Well, <laughs> that's, it, that's an interesting suggestion. I mean, um, we will um, we will roll out um, collection of feedback from all research council funded students um, next time. So the idea is that we start people thinking about this reporting early in their career. And in fact, actually, we get much better feedback from early stage researchers than later stage researchers. They might be so much um, more busy, I don't know. But uh, anyway, we get much better feedback. Um, uh, so uh, I think the thing is, it's, a fa it's going to be a fact of life. The people who fund research, the people who employ the researchers, will both want to know a lot about, in a timely fashion about the way the research is progressing. So whatever route that's captured through, um, that will have to be part of a researcher's life. Yeah, and of course the Scottish version of the research pitch is obviously deep fried. Anybody else? Back. 
Yeah, so it's an interesting problem, isn't it, that you could have 20 year timeline for research to bear fruit and you're trying to get a thorough get outcome measure which over a year, two year, three year funding cycle will predict what the true outcome of it is. So what steps are you going to take to evaluate the utility of your target outcomes or are you just going to assume that you can only measure what you can measure so you'll measure that? So, um, so we, we think that we've pretty much got covered um, most aspects of, of research activities and the outcomes from research. Um, I think actually we, we, we collect too much and in too much detail, so we would like to focus that down a bit and, 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 um, and capture less. So we need to take decisions about what information we are using regularly and what is giving us most insight into the way that research is progressing. And there's some, the thing is that different stakeholders have different opinions on that because um, at the outset of this process, I wasn't, for instance, terribly interested in capturing a lot of detail about researchers' awards and recognition. So, but researchers were very keen about giving us that information. <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, those, that's one discussion of many hundreds about uh, collecting this information. And we're trying to balance the needs of now 100 research organisations using the system in the UK. So there's a lot of discussion over, you know, well, I, I'd like this bit of information. Well, we don't collect that yet, or we collect it in a different way. So I think it's constantly evolving. But I'd like to um, always take opportunities to reduce the burden on researchers. And that means collecting less or in less detail, or finding smarter ways to capture that information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Something I couldn't get to because I ran out of time was a, a interesting discussion I had a few weeks ago about different approach to research assessment instead of looking at the outputs to look at the process in, in much detail. So, which is sort of very much what you were discussing in your presentation. Um, so, which is really we are a long way from that, but looking at sort of day-to-day -day work and trying to capture this in some meaningful and, and hopefully automated ways so that you're not reporting instead of every three months you do it every day. <laughs> um, but this gives you both a more timely picture of what people are doing and it sort of also takes away from things which, uh, well, where you just spend time time to, to publish something because, because before it becomes visible. Um, and of course, this was also an approach which was very much focused on research data, so the whole aspect of reproducibility, et cetera, that you have a much closer look into these issues. several talks now about um, some of the problems with the current system of um, citations and impact assessment and all of that stuff. Um, now, there's things um, that could be done, I guess, from the top down, but what about from the bottom up, right? A lot of junior researchers, from PhD students to junior faculty, are still being funneled into the system where, where they are being judged based on these very archaic and abhorrent standards. Um, for example, there was a meeting or department about you know, evaluation yesterday, and um, the administrator level person was saying like, you know, we need to publish Wine Nature, for instance. And one of the junior faculty was like, you know, well, you know, there are these problems with the way you know, it's being assessed right now and all that stuff, right? And then the administrator just said, well, you're only complaining about this because you can't do any good research. Um, so I think this is just an example of how entrenched these, um, s this very sick system is in current academia. So is there anything specific that um, junior researchers like us, you think, can do uh, to help improve this 
without endangering our future professional careers, and if there is um, any hope at all. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I mean, the example that you quote, I think, is, could probably be retold uh, you know, across the country. That's horrific. You know, the, the statements that that administrator made are uh, you know, dreadful. You know, to sort of say, well, you're obviously complaining because you're obviously not good enough, based on a judgment that, you know, good only good, uh, you know, only publication in certain journals uh, qualifies you as, as as a good researcher. But that's the nature of the game that we play, unfortunately. I think early career researchers are in a particularly invidious and difficult position. And although, of course, you know, the problems that I and others have talked about at this meeting today, they're long-standing. They've been known for 10, 20 years. People have realized there is this um, difficulty. But I, do t you know, I don't think it's incumbent on early career researchers to solve a problem that's simply being imposed on them you know, from above, from the people who've gone before, people like me. I mean, I definitely played the game uh, to, get, you know, to become a professor. You know, when I was appointed 20 years ago, uh, that was the writing on the wall, that was the word on the street. You know, publish well, get grants, do a little bit of teaching, keep your nose clean, but you know, publish, get grants. Uh, and by the way, publish and get grants, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's, that's what everybody understands. And I do think it is incumbent actually on that senior generation or that developed generation to set an example and to help uh, mitigate the risks for early career researchers. So Randy Shackman, who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago and then declared, uh, I'm not gonna publish in Nature, Cell or Science anymore, after he'd published in Nature, Cell and Science in order to get a career that eventually won him a Nobel Prize. So he got slated for being a massive hypocrite, but actually that was a very clever piece of PR. You know, what better time to do that in, than in the week that you're getting your award? And fair play to him. Now the people in his lab, he had a discussion with them. And so someone like Randy Shecklin, he's well known, uh, he has high esteem, and so anyone actually working in his lab then you know, they can put that on their CV. And Randy Shepman can write them a reference to say, my lab has this policy of not publishing these journals. This guy, this woman, whoever's working here, uh, they did some fantastic work and you, know, you should totally hire them, you should totally uh, fund their grant. And so I think they can help mitigate them. And I would, I would you know, early career researchers, you, you've got to look after number one and number one is you, okay? So if you feel you're under pressure to play the game, play the game, okay? because you, you don't really have a choice. It's not down to you to take all the risks, but it is down to the establishment, as it were, people like me, universities, to really break out of this game. And I know there are criticisms of DORA, and we can have discussion about that, but it is an important set of principles, and it does actually help to equip universities, for example, with the tools to, to try and do assessment more properly, but it tells you about the state of the culture, in the UK at least, uh, when you learn that only three UK universities have signed and all the rest have not. So I think hard questions need to be asked of all the rest. I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely echo that. Um, I suppose it doesn't preclude you necessarily from doing things that are on top of playing the game as it is now, right? So I'm, I'm sure we talked earlier on about the software and data sets thing. You know, you can still deposit raw data for a paper and picture it without Luckily now, I think we reached the point where you're not going to you know, stop yourself from getting published in some of these journals because you've made some of the data available and that kind of thing. So there's probably still little things you can do, but yeah, that can't, unless you're going to overthrow the system from the inside. You know. okay. Have a question at the top here. Shall we check it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, your thoughts about the alternative approach, or an alternative approach, in addition to playing the game, which is to ensure that your your paper is well published, as I say, good documentation, your code is well published, your APIs are well published, because it's not sufficient to say, you know, I've got this data, it would be nice if it was. You've really got to think of your audience. You want your data to be consumed. You want your code to be consumed. You want your APIs to be consumed. So I think that in addition to playing the game of making the statement, the statement, the summary statement appears as a short piece on blah, 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 if one wants to shift it, then you've got to make the effort to see how those alternative sources of record, of findings, are in fact consumed. It's not enough to pick up the leading 
get, it gets, gets up. No, it's not enough just to put the data at the center. You've really got to think of how your stuff will be consumed and will be regarded as attractive. So that, that's what I would hope that you would make some comment on it to get a message to a question. But yeah, just like that. I, I think that is a good point. And, but it, it comes back, I think, to what I said, which is to sort of showing researchers what the benefits of doing that are. And I think there are um, good examples of good practice to be had, you know, to come back to the previous question about, you know, is there any hope? I definitely think there is hope. I think the landscape is changing. One example I would give is a guy, there's a guy called Bernard Rontier, who is the uh, head of uh, the University of Liège, who set up an open access repository and basically insisted that all staff use it. And the way that he insisted on that uh, was to say that, well, if you're applying to me for promotion, don't, don't bother sit at submitting uh, lists of your publications in, in your CV, I'll get them from the institutional repository. And so suddenly everybody put all their papers in the institutional repository. And they put in place all the technical help to help them make it easy for them to do that. And then uh, once they had done it, many of them started discovering, actually people around the world are downloading my research and reading it. And so they realized there was a much broader audience for a lot of the work that they were doing than they had known before. And I think if you get those positive messages out to people, uh, then not only you know, will that encourage them to be more open, but they can see the benefit of it, and they should also be rewarded for it. And I think you know, uh, funders and universities have got a role in, in sort of putting in place those incentives and those in inducements, shall we say, which is why I think the HEFSI policy on open access is a good one, even though it, it has had pushback from some Russell Group universities and it has had pushback from some major... Uh, publishers who aren't yet uh, fully convinced of the merits of open access, but I hope they will stick to their guns, and I think that's the sort of thing that can help. Now, I think that's been our policy since 2005, actually, that it should be, yes. Published in PubMed, uh, PubMed and made available in PubMed Central. So that's our open access policy. But what about reducing the embargo period from six months oh. to zero? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, thank, thank you very much for that. And um, that brings us to the end of the session today. Um, but just before uh, we all go out for a nice cold beer or a glass of wine um, outside, I'd just like to say a few thank yous, first of all. Um, so first, a huge thank you to the um, 11 speakers that we had today. Um, who have t given up their time to come and speak to us. So if we could just give them a big round of applause for us. <laughs> it's not too absolutely fascinating. We have filled them all. We're going to run them by all the speakers first, and then uh, hopefully if they're okay with them, we'll be putting them online so you can view them again. And for people who haven't seen the conference today, they can also see them. Uh, next, I would like to say an absolute huge thank you to our sponsors. Uh, first of all, to GitHub. Um, who have been a main, one, a main sponsor today and will also be sponsoring our hat day tomorrow, which I'll come on to say something about. Uh, thanks to Arfon for flying all the way over from Chicago for two days uh, to come and speak to us as well this morning. Also, a huge thank you to Mendeley. Um, hopefully you got a chance to, to go and see their stand outside and take some of their swag. I got a t-shirt as well. Um, I'm going to see if I can get a little pad and some things as well if there's any left when I go back out. Huge thank you to those guys as well um, for coming along today and for sponsoring us as well. Um, so we're just remembering <laughs> um, And also to um, the co-organisers for the event, to Graham, uh, to Jan, who's outside organising the beer, uh, to <laughs> Anders, who's been helping us out with loads today with the registration and all of the um, running around with the mic and everything as well. And also to Peter, who has been filming the whole day uh, very diligently today as well. So a huge thank you to the organisers as well. coming in as well and being, um, being a great audience, sorry, terrible expression, um, for coming in. I hope you've enjoyed the day. Um, please do uh, answer a feedback survey that I'll be sending out at some point over the weekend. I would really be 
uh, interested to know what you thought of the day. If you had any suggestions for next year, for speakers, for other topics that you would like covered, please do let us know. We really want to hear about it. And finally, uh, tomorrow we have our hack day. Uh, I know some people in here have signed up for it already. Uh, it's actually got a really good uh, load of people that signed up. It's got over 50, actually. Uh, we signed up for our hack day tomorrow. I know there's some ideas on the web. If you go to the reconevent.com website, look up hack day. There's a link to a spreadsheet which has already got some ideas on it that people have shared that they would like to explore tomorrow. Please do feel free to add to that if you're coming along tomorrow. If you haven't signed up, come along and talk to us and we'll see if you want to come along. Uh, we'll see about getting you a spot as well. There will be beer, there will be pizza. There will be awesome prizes. Um, this being the key component. Uh, not only has GitHub, who are sponsoring us, very generously offered us uh, our, their gold private repo, I'm saying this wrong, um, but yes, which is worth a lot of money uh, to some winners. Um, but also we have um, something that's very famously drinkable in Scotland as a prize. Um, no prizes for guessing really what that is. Uh, yeah, of course it's iron brew. No, but we're going to have iron brew as well. Um, and we also have some other very interesting geeky prizes from Forbidden Planet, some of which you can wear, uh, some of which you can use as wallets, uh, and others that are famous games that I'm not going to tell you any more about, but they're all really, really cool. Uh, so please do come along and talk to us if you want to come along. And if you're coming anyway, tomorrow we'll see you then. And if you can keep your badge, if you're coming to the hack day tomorrow, that'd be great as well. Uh, thank you all very much, and please come outside and enjoy a glass of wine or a beer in the chat. Thanks a lot. Okay.